This is going to be a story that's largely about flowers, but not ones you'd find at your local florist. And like it did for us, this story is going to change the way you look at them. So who's behind this epiphany? AMKK consists of botanical artist Makoto Azuma and photographer Shunsuke Shinoki. These two best friends go way back to high school in Fukuoka, a prefecture in Japan's southwestern Kyushu Island. Now, despite coming to Tokyo in the late 90s with the hopes of becoming rock musicians, things changed when Makoto took a part-time job at the Ota Market, one of the country's largest flower and produce markets. That inspired Makoto to begin his career working with flowers. So he partnered with Shunsuke, and from there on, they set out to create vivid works based solely on plants and flowers. So I first heard of AMKK a few years ago through Japanese DJ and designer Hiroshi Fujiwara's The Pool Aoyama, a Tokyo-based concept store that's since closed. I remember seeing images online of this pop-up flower shop in the middle of a retail space, which received a lot of attention from the fashion community. Yet, these types of collaborations never did AMKK justice. Sure, they went on to create great products with brands like Fragment Design and the Park in Ginza, two labels that Fujiwara also spearheads. And that undoubtedly pushed their brand towards the mainstream consciousness, which is great. However, how can we expect commercial product to carry an artist's true vision? I wasn't aware of the breadth of Makoto and Shinsuke's work, and I was familiar with this fashion product. I thought they were just florists. And then I dug deeper. I picked up a copy of their Encyclopedia of Flowers number two, and I was hooked. Their stark presentation of floral arrangements are unique and highlights sexuality and gender norms in flowers. Interestingly, the first interaction that a lot of people have with AMKK is through printed matter. That, well, they've caught a glimpse of their shiki installation online which is this five-foot-tall bonsai that sits suspended inside a steel frame. And they've displayed this thing everywhere. Desert, sand dune, sandstone, waterfall, geyser, glacier, you name it. They've even sent this bloody thing into space. So when I reached out a short while ago, I was really excited to hear that they were working on a new project called Shikito. Oh, I was excited too. And just so everyone knows, that to in Shikito means winter. I remember we met up with them in Hong Kong and you guys wanted me there as a backup interpreter for you and Alex. Right. Remember how they invited us to hang out with them in the vast plains of Hokkaido while they set up? Yeah, they were so casual about it. At that time of the year, this was back in February, mind you, the area was essentially a blanket of snow. We're talking single digits in Fahrenheit, or about minus 15 degrees Celsius. And that's not including wind chill. Also, the latest Shiki was an 18 to 20 foot monster of a tree that looked challenging to install to say the least. And having seen the images now, I do kind of wish we had taken them up on their offer. But as you'll see, we had a great experience with them in Tokyo. We sure did. And as we of course worked out the logistics behind the trip, The conversation waded into talk about what they did in their spare time. And they said they had a band, and we were naturally intrigued. So just for reference, Makoto has medium-length bleached blonde hair, and Shinsuke has glasses and rocks a mean fro. These are not guys that look like your average florists. So I thought, okay, these guys are cool, and they work with flowers. So when they said band, I was personally assuming light rock. Or maybe even reggae? Yeah. But man, were we wrong. The day after we touched down in Tokyo, we had the rare pleasure of shooting their band practice. Now, most of the outside world knows AMKK only through their sublime floral installations and arrangements. And if you are familiar with AMKK's work, you've probably only heard of Makoto. So it was almost fitting that we had our first interaction with Makoto and Shinsuke in a basement music room. We witnessed a passion for grunge like no other and a genuine friendship that extends outside the office. And that was it for four hours. Beers and cameras in hand, 
we listen to Makoto, Shunsuke, and their band go nuts. Few have ever experienced the musical side of AMKK. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I don't listen to rock much, but the two describe their sound as hard rock and grungy. For those of you born into the late 90s, grunge was a genre that enjoyed a short and sweet life for that generation, until its popularity waned before the new millennium. It combined other hard rock elements of punk and heavy metal, like distorted guitars and the obvious sense of rebellion. But grunge was distinct for its unflinching treatment of reality through its sounds and themes. It was often socially conscious and explored loftier topics than what most mainstream genres were singing about. And while they don't claim grunge has directly influenced their work, Makoto and Shunsuke say the energy surrounding their music fuels their work from a motivational standpoint. I asked them if such a hard style of music was simply a release from their busy schedule. As a concept, just because something's got a punk influence, it doesn't mean destroy everything. What I get from punk is simply not being satisfied with the status quo. Trying to break that down and make it better. It makes me want to do something tomorrow that was better than what I did today. True enough, we felt that energy in the practice room. Their plan was to play a few more songs and then call it a day. But something was different. It could have been the day in question, or the fact that we were recording the session on Instagram Live. That raw energy welled up and spilled out as Makoto, Shinsuke and the band went into overdrive, playing progressively harder and harder until they looked like they had finished a set at Lollapalooza. You wouldn't have known they'd only been together for two weeks. And what's more is, they only played original songs. I'm talking lyrics, music, it was nuts. I cheekily asked Makoto for song titles at the end of each set, and his response each time was untitled. Ears ringing and hearts thumping, the four of us still stood there thinking, these guys work with flowers? For our second day with AMKK, we were invited to their studio in Minato, Tokyo. Where Makoto and Shinsuke would later give us full access to their world. Literally. We met Makoto on the doorstep of his condo on a cold but sunny Sunday morning. And that's how the day started. We shadowed him on his morning commute to work, passing through the Nishi Azabu district. It was about a 20 minute walk door to door, or 10 minutes by BMX if you're Makoto. I distinctly remember a moment during the commute when Shunsuke popped up out of nowhere. Yeah, he caught us by surprise, eh? Like, we knew he lived close by, but it was like he knew exactly which corner Makoto would be at at that exact moment. And it seemed completely normal to Makoto. Don't forget, these guys have spent almost every day together for over a decade. Monday through Sunday, from 7am to 6pm. I wonder how they do it. Your high school friends and now you work together 24-7? I'm surprised they haven't strangled each other yet. You're right. I mean, after working 16 hours straight with you guys, even I was ready to strangle someone. As we approached their studio, it became clear why Makoto suggested that we document this part of their morning routine. It's because it's all part of their creative process, which we discovered actually just involves a lot of regularity and repetition. Makoto's face lit up as he explained several crazy ideas on the way over, including the Shiki installation that he sent up into orbit together with JP Aerospace. It's during this simple morning commute where he finds a lot of inspiration that goes into AMKK's projects. Still, there's a lot more to AMKK than just botanical arrangements and installations and we were eager to see it all for ourselves. But, of course, not before Makoto and Shinsuke pulled out their Ico smokeless cigarettes, poured themselves a cup of coffee, and slipped on their custom white lab coats. All part of their morning ritual. Now, 
In the minds of many, flowers are decidedly still something that's reserved for special occasions and maybe the odd allergic reaction. Similarly, when we understood the art of arranging flowers, we defaulted to thinking about ornate flower beds or maybe ikebana, the minimalist traditional Japanese art. But there's something entirely different about AMKK's work. Their studio is divided into an office and photo studio upstairs and a work area downstairs that can be best described as a laboratory. So, after Makoto and Shunsuke finished their smokes, we headed downstairs. Inside the temperature-controlled basement, Makoto and his team of assistants started the day by emptying a large central refrigerator packed with freshly picked flowers from Oda Market. From there, it was a fast-paced flurry of activity as they were hard at work snipping stems and preparing buds for arrangements to go into the studio for the day, to fill the 20 daily orders for customers, and to set aside for other projects. Interestingly though, most of the flowers would wind up right back in the refrigerator at the end of the day. And as you can hear, there wasn't a lot of talking going on because everyone knew what they were doing. Within a matter of minutes, the lab transformed from this cold, sterile environment into this warm, lush space. Makoa referred to this procedure as waking up the flowers, which took the whole team about two hours to complete. It's hard to imagine that they repeat this process twice per day just to ensure that the flowers are up to their standards. As these flowers woke up, their fragrance filled the specially outfitted space designed by Makoto and Shinsuke. This blended with a thin mist of water vapor flowing from a machine in the corner of the room. Every so often, Makoto would walk over to an open gas flame that flickered in the front room, keeping his hands warm from handling the chilled flowers. Around us, the sterile glass, steel, and concrete reminded us that AMKK treats flowers as more than just pretty shapes and colors. Near the work area is a greenhouse that channels sunlight from the street level into the basement so that Makoto can monitor how certain specimens fare in natural light and over time. Like some brilliant mad scientist, he scribbles his findings on a wall-sized chalkboard and a notebook inside. Back upstairs, Shinsuke was setting up his studio space to shoot a few specimens for the day. Created just for Macon, these included a flower bed arrangement, a jar of wilting flower petals and leaves to be preserved later, and an experimental take on Ikebana. And though soft-spoken in person, Shinsuke speaks literal volumes through his photography. Makoto seemed content with sitting back and leaving his creation in the capable hands of his friend. It's thanks to Shunsuke that AMKK's work is forever documented in three rightfully called encyclopedias, which he commissioned from a small Swiss agency. And in fact, some of the specimens depicted in their books are actually splices of different flower varieties that might never be made again. On these pages, the ephemeral nature of flowers meets the harshness, the rawness, but also brutal honesty of grunge. Through Shunsuke's adept photography and coloring, all is laid bare, whether it's flowers or other plants like trees or even fungi. Shot against minimal backgrounds like the walls of their workspace or on a white background, the colors and details are presented in an unflinching realism. AMKK's style contrasts with a perhaps more edenic view of plants that features almost exclusively blooms, a bright but far less saturated palette, and a focus on the living aspect of flowers. It's here where you could argue that the worldly yet unseen thematic influences of grunge live on. AMKK's work neither undersells their subject matter by diluting it down to fairy tale-like meadows, nor does it put it on a pedestal like a roped-off gallery painting. Makoto and Shunsuke's work is not only beautiful, accessible and honest, but also thought-provoking. It's very difficult to convey just how much we walked away with in our short two days with them. At the shallow yet under-considered end, 
Their art speaks so loudly that many tend to forget that they're both men, working with subjects still largely considered feminine. Now, while this fact could make larger splashes in, say, American headlines, Shunsuke notes that the issue barely makes a ripple at home. It's a good environment. It doesn't really make much of a difference. We don't really notice it much. There's more men now. Of course, at the beginning, when we first started working with flowers, there weren't many men. We did get mistaken as gay a few times. But in this industry, there's people from all walks of life. It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, gay or lesbian. For context, Japan already has an appreciation for flowers deeply built into the culture. Flower viewing picnics, or hanami, are seasonal gatherings for people to enjoy the transient beauty of cherry or plum blossoms. Coupled with a diverse creative community, AM Kiki's work is right at home in contexts where flowers are both admired and valued. This includes doing arrangements for French high fashion brand Hermes, for example. But for guys like us who have a relatively limited view of flowers, AMKK's perspective was eye opening to say the least, and perhaps our first true meaningful connection with them. It's coming to appreciate a subject that you otherwise wouldn't because of how it's presented to you. These two guys aren't out there to change the gender associations around flowers, but by showing us flowers that, for lack of a better explanation, don't look like the flowers in your grandmother's garden. They changed how we could approach them. It was an alternative path to appreciating the visual beauty of flowers. But like many great or beautiful things not in nature, it comes at a cost. Despite the quality and success of their works, Makoto and Shunsuke are both wary of the contradictions behind producing them. If we want to produce nice flowers, that takes a lot of energy, right? So we definitely question ourselves as to whether that's right or not. It's kind of ironic that by trying to fulfill very human desires, that we play a part in all of that. What's more is we create flowers with a human connection and keep using energy to do that. I think that's a huge problem. So we're at the point where we really have to think about how we treat energy use and flower production. So that might involve things like looking for them in the wild and then so on. For two people whose livelihoods hinge on creating amazing but highly impermanent arrangements, debating the cost of beauty sounds like a step backwards. But when your medium is a living thing, many living things, it's a conversation you can't really avoid. AMKK has traveled across the world for commercial, artistic, and charity projects. Looking back on those journeys, Makoto remarks on the deep significance of flowers to humanity as a whole. Humanity has always, at least I think so, had that tradition of offering flowers when someone's died. That has probably transcended culture and race. We travel a lot across the world, but even in conflicted regions, poor countries, or rich countries, there's always a florist. Like, it means that for people the world over, they need flowers. I mean, even in the Amazon, somewhere that has loads of flowers, there's a florist. As a symbol that, even when offered at a funeral, celebrates life past or present, Flowers make simple but powerful reminders. Before saying goodbye to MKK, we were taken to one last spot, their small discreet gallery nearby. Inside, we saw a row of three bonsais suspended in steel cubes. As seen in other shiki installations, the common theme behind MKK's grander works is the existence, no, persistence, of natural things against the harshness of the unnatural, the organic against the inorganic, the green against the gray, and the random against the structured. Although the trees in these pieces are understandably kept alive, preserved to keep their buyers happy, most of AMKK's work isn't. Lifespans for specific breeds will vary, but the result is the same. They will live, be seen, smelled, and touched, only to wither away and perish. 
It's this key stage that Makoto is constantly trying to capture, aging the dying flowers in jars for weeks on end before immortalizing them in resin. And that's always been the key tenet of AMKK's philosophy, faithfully portraying every stage of a plant's life cycle, even the stages we would prefer not to confront ourselves. Though many will always remain fearful of dying, in the context of flowers at least, we can appreciate that there is both truth and maybe even beauty in death. In Makoto's words describing their floral arrangements, they age 10 years for every day. If we were fated with the same pace, how many days would we try to live? So stop and smell the flowers. Because they're not going to last forever. We'd like to thank Makoto and Shinsuke for their time and access, as well as AMKK's project manager, Eri Narita, and, of course, our good friend, Julia Huang, for her help.